Coming up, we've got a special edition of This Week in Creationism. Yes, changes are afoot at Answers in Genesis. And we need to talk about this leadership transition that's occurring. And think about the future of Answers in Genesis. We've got that coming up next. All right, we have to talk a little bit about Ken Ham and the ministry of Answers in Genesis because they're going to be experiencing some changes. And the things that Ken Ham has been saying over the last oh, six months or so um, really tells you that he is preparing for this transition or has been preparing for this transition for, well, really for a year or two, um, but it's really come in earnest lately. And just yesterday we had the announcement by Martin Isles that he had been accepted by the board as the new CEO of Answers in Genesis. Now, interestingly, Answers in Genesis itself, in terms of the homepage, uh, Ken Ham's uh, uh, blog, uh, Ken Ham's Facebook page and Twitter, has yet to mention uh, this decision uh, by the board of Answers in Genesis. I really don't understand why that is the case, because I thought they would be the ones to make that particular announcement, but Martin Isles has already told us that uh, that he's uh, been given the... Um, keys to the kingdom, uh, so to speak. Now, in his message, he talks about working alongside Ken Ham and sort of as a sort of sort of joint CEOs, although Ken Ham is now the, the founding CEO, whereas Martin Isles is the acting or uh, executive CEO now of Answers in Genesis. Um, but we'll explore that in just a minute. Let's, let's move back a little bit and just talk about uh, Ken Ham's preparation for this moment and how this might surprise some people, although the more I've thought about uh, Martin Isles, who is somebody I didn't know at all, was unaware of um, as of a year ago. So it wasn't on my radar at all in terms of thinking about like, what's going to happen to Andrews in Genesis? How is he going to find a, a predecessor to be able to to carry on his, his work? Um, many people have looked at various family members uh, of Ken Ham. He has a, a large number of people that are Part of this is immediate family and extended family that work for Answers in Genesis. Um, but many of them have taken a, well, they've always had a backseat to Ken Ham, but many of them have taken even more of a backseat, uh, less of a prominent uh, front or person role. And there's really isn't anyone else at Answers in Genesis who has a, like a huge name or following and, or is not really old themselves and really not capable of continuing uh, the Answers in Genesis ministry. So it's always it's always been kind of a question as to what would happen. Now, my original idea was it was going to be Calvin Smith, um, who I think is a fairly dynamic speaker, very bold, has all the sort of the the um, culture wars um, credentials the, that Ken Ham would be looking for, um, and is the CEO of Answers in Genesis in Canada, uh, which is a very small, tiny branch of the international outfit that is Answers in Genesis. Um, but I, I don't know what you know Calvin Smith has done or whatever to alienate himself, but he doesn't seem to be at all part of the main organization. Um, I don't really know anything more about Calvin Smith and his relationship. I've never heard any rumors or anything about him. I've just always thought he was a like a, of all the people I thought about at Answers in Genesis or worked in their umbrella organization. I thought he was the most viable candidate, but. Um, you know, I, I, apparently not, you know, he's, he's still going to continue to do what he's doing, but that's going to get me to, I don't, I don't know where this is going to go. I got a couple slides. I got some things I want to show you, but, uh, I think in the end, I want to say that, um, this is going to be a very interesting shaking out period because any organization, this isn't just true of answers in Genesis, but any organization that's led by a charismatic leader who has many, many friends that surround him who have been cultivated over the years. I mean, certainly over 20 years, uh, some people have come and gone from Answers in Genesis, and the ones that have gone are ones that simply can't, you know, become, Ken Ham is unpalatable them, or they they cannot come to a working relationship. Uh, and those who do end up working for him for a long time are simpatico in terms of all their thoughts and uh, dreams and desires, right? So it's a it's a very uniform organization at the top in terms of those those individuals working there. Um, and so whenever you bring in, you know, so it'd be natural to think, well, you should have one of those individuals continue the uh, ministry because 
they'll have that sort of uniform thought and they'll also know the individuals that are there and they can continue to work together. This is truly bringing in an outsider, right? A complete outsider. I mean, I don't know how long Ken Ham has known Martin Niles, but he certainly hasn't really talked about Ken, uh, Martin Niles and Martin Niles has had no um, workings with um, answers in Genesis in the past hasn't really ever talked about them. Um, yeah, as, as I'm going to show you, he has been influenced by answers in Genesis material back when he was very young, uh, and he is a good 20, 30 years, well, at least 30 years younger than uh, than Ken Ham is, uh, and grew up on answers in Genesis material. But it's not a large part of his repertoire in terms of like what he speaks about and what he's been concerned about most of his life as a as a lawyer. And I mean, he's into politics and a bunch of other stuff, all right, um, but not so much young earth creationism, certainly. And, but is Answers in Genesis really a young earth creationist ministry? I mean, yes, it's kind of founded on young earth creationism as sort of its platform for um, delivering information, right? They got a creation museum and they have the Ark Encounter and it's it's all about the, you know, answering questions about dinosaurs and scientific questions about the world's age and uh, the development of, of life on Earth. Uh, you might think that that's the, like, the foundation, but really, you can't really rip that foundation out because that's central to their uh, apologetic, which is a scientific apologetic of... Uh, rope people into like, hey, they have these questions about like, were there dinosaurs on the ark? And did dinosaurs live with man? Uh, and we're going to answer those questions. But ultimately, that's not that's not what Answers in Genesis wants to do. That's, at the end of the day, that's that's not the thing that they're like, okay, we, we gave you those answers. Great, go on, figure out the rest of your life. No, they want to figure out the rest of your life. Right? They, they want to provide you with all the answers, right? It's, it's answers in Genesis. And that's all the answers to every question uh, you may have. Um, and so they are very much a, a, a total uh, Christian apologetics ministry and has become more and more and more so uh, over time. All right, so rather than me rambling, let's, let's read a little bit uh, of background and then we'll talk about Martin Niles, uh, who is the, the new uh, head honcho at Answers in Genesis. So this is just from a couple months ago. Uh, in which Ken Ham introduces Martin Niles to the broader audience of, of Andrews and Genesis followers. All right, and notice the title of this article, Hope for America, right? Hope for America, because Andrews and Genesis is the, the answer for America and the, the answer for how um, we ought to live. From post-Christian ministry in Australia, right? Australia is like, what potentially America could become, or, or according to many, it already is, right, a post-Christian nation. And so Australia is already dealing with being a non-Christian secular society. And what Ken Ham has done is he's plucked somebody from that particular uh, world, right, who's lived in that kind of world, that, that secular world, and, and worked in it. Uh, and he's plucked somebody from that, that's post-Christian society. I say like, um, and there's somebody who's fighting back against that in Australia and doing, according to Ken Ham, a, you know, amazing job and look at all the things he's, he's been able to accomplish uh, in Australia to sort of hold back the floodwaters as much as possible there. And he's bringing this person from this post-Christian world to America, right? This place is, is close, is on the precipice or maybe has already fallen off is on the slope down toward being a completely post-Christian nation. Um, and Martin Isles, like Ken Ham, sees himself as somebody as the, the stopgap measure, right? The person that's, that's trying to hold at bay this um, uh, modernism, postmodernism, um, secularism, um, critical theory influenced uh, society. We'll look at those terms later and realize that I don't think, well, I mean, they love to throw those terms around, whether they understand what they are or not. So, who is this person? This is Martin Niles, and that's who Ken Ham introduced in this particular um, article. So he begins with something that I've talked about many times over the last, well, really five or six years uh, on my blog at different times about like, you know, there's going to come a point in which there's going to be a transition. You have to transition from Ken Ham to something else. 
Uh, and Ken, uh, and Answers in Genesis is the biggest you know, young earth creationist ministry. And as I said before, they're well beyond just being a young earth creationist community. And so it's a it's a Christian apologetics uh, ministry, which is, has a large amount of influence now uh, and a continuing increase in influence uh, in this country. Uh, so this really is an important moment uh, because it's going to very much shape a segment of Christian um, society, Christian um Christian public, because it's very much going to shape a, a considerable uh, component of the Christian uh, population of this country. And so here we go. Uh, one of the questions I've received over the years from supporters, especially in recent times, right, because I'm getting older, <laughs> goes something like this. What is Answers in Genesis doing for the leadership of, for the future? Who are you training up to take the place of the founders? Right? There's a Ken Ham's not the only individual in the organization that uh, is aging. Like Andrew Snelling, who is the editor of their journal, uh, is as old, probably around about the same age as, as uh, Ken Ham, early 70s. Uh, and there's a number of other, well, Terry Mortensen and several others. And, and many of these have already sort of uh, faded off quite a bit. You know, once in a while they have an article, but they're not really doing much speaking anymore. Um, their activity levels are far lower. Uh, and there is a younger generation. Uh, he's brought in a number of, of young PhDs to do sort of some of the, the, the answering science questions. Um, but it doesn't really have, an, and a and few, uh, I guess you could say, apologists or communicators that are younger. Um, but again, like I said, none of those have really, you know, taken hold in terms of like having that charismatic um, leadership characteristic such that they could actually take over someday. So they've been in a situation for a while where if Ken Ham were something, you know, drastic were to happen to him, right? He was incapacitated or, or died suddenly. Um, what would what would Answers in Genesis do? I mean, I'm sure they've always had some contingent plan, but I'm, I'm not sure it's ever been a very good one up until this particular point. I, I think they have, I think Ken Ham has found lightning in a bottle potentially. Uh, of course, lightning can also be dangerous, right? And so there's... Anytime you transition, you're going to, uh, I began to say something before and I, I got off on a tangent, but like I was saying about how Ken Ham knows everybody's very comfortable with everybody there. And I think everyone who's there, who's survived as long as they have, have reached some comfort level with Ken Ham and know sort of like how to operate with him. I mean, I don't think he's an, a, an easy person to, to work with. Um, and so you have to really be, you know, simpatico with him, you know, have a mind meld with him to really be able to work with him. Uh, and when you bring out somebody from outside, who even though, you know, just on the surface, like hearing what he says, he sounds a lot like Ken Ham and he says a lot of the same things. And he's, you know, it's all about biblical authority. He has the same keywords and phrases. Um, he's got, he's got a few new ones, right? That are, they're catchphrases that are Australian, of course, because Martin Isles is Australian. So there's a theme of, of continuing to have a spokesperson that has a, uh, a funny, interesting accent, uh, which is always great for, for speaking. Um, but surely he has other quirks in his character, right? And, and his personality. And he definitely does have a little bit different personality. He's, he seems more personable on the surface uh, than Ken Ham is, who um, seems to always have to like work really hard to, you know, if he was a politician, he's, he's one that kind of like has to force himself to smile and force himself to try to try to make jokes and do the things that politicians need to do and, and hold babies, even though he doesn't want to actually do those types of things. All right, so let's talk about this Martin Isles. Uh, let's just start with uh, you know, what he said a few days ago. All right, so he announced on Facebook, I assume elsewhere, I know there was an email that also went out from, uh, actually an email went out from Martin Isles uh, through Answers in Genesis because he has been working for Answers, Answers in Genesis for the last two months. So he's only officially come on board like sometime in August, I think. Uh, and so he is an official employee of Answers in Genesis already under a different, under a different heading, right? Under a different position. Um, and now he's announcing that just a few months later, he has a new position that he's been given. So let's take a look at this. It's a great honor to announce I've been promoted to the position of executive CEO um, by the board of Answers in Genesis. Fear not, Ken Ham is still the founding CEO, right? So we, we have a new title for Ken Ham. It's now founding CEO. We are leading together for the next season. 
right? For a season of time, we'll be leading together. Like we're co-CEOs. Um, and I really, Ken Ham has not been a, like an active executive sort of type CEO for quite a while anyway. Um, he's not involved in the day-to-day nitty gritty of, of directing things. He's just, you know, broad, big oversight. Um, of course he has a huge amount of influence and say, uh, as, as the CEO, but he really doesn't do things. I mean, it's, he doesn't do, he talks when he, where he wants to talk and he mostly does a lot of writing, right? A lot of just like, here's, here's things I'm thinking about a lot of stuff that's going to be on Facebook or Twitter and responding to people. And, uh, and then some of that filters up to the answers in Genesis website, but he's kind of like off doing his own thing, uh, most of the time. So I'm sure he's going to continue to do those things as long as he can. But Martin Isles is really now the CEO, all right, of Answers in Genesis and will be is really taking the reins of that day to day operation and decision making in terms of like, where do we put our donation dollars, you know, to work? Uh, what 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 areas are we going to place emphasis on? Um, and so I don't know what a season means. A season means as long as they can continue to work together, as long as Ken Ham's able to do things um, like he would like to do, I'm sure he'll be allowed to do, right? Um, this is an arrangement designed to set answers in Genesis up for the future. So here's, here's uh, Martin Isle's perception of like his role and purpose and why he's been brought in, right? That's, that's part of this announcement here. It means our feet are firmly planted in our foundation whilst we adapt to a new era. Now, interesting, interesting wording there. As we adapt to a new era. Um, Ancient Genesis needs to adapt. I don't, I wouldn't read into this like Ken Ham was not able to adapt. Like he was inflexible and we're bringing in, you know, we're bringing in the new guy and the new guy is going to be able to like, switch and change answers in Genesis in the direction they're going. No, Ken Ham is clearly, if you've read any of his writing over the last six months, he has clearly placed the answers in Genesis ship on a trajectory and it's a trajectory that can't easily be moved, right? He's put into place actually rules uh, in the, um, basically he's created board rules um, to establish a, uh, how should I put it? I can't remember exactly how he put it. Um, a set of procedures that if you were want to change any of the rules in Ed Answers in Genesis, like any of the foundational sort of uh, um, set of guidelines, uh, statements of faith, right? He's, he's bolstered the statement of faith policy by adding a lot of different things to it, all right? He continues to add to it all the things you, you have to state you believe if you work for Answers in Genesis. And he's made it harder to change that list. Um, and he's instituted a, like basically a review type cycle where people, individuals are reviewed and their works, their words are reviewed and so forth. And so he's tightened up control even more and set into place ways in which even when he's gone, that control will be there. Therefore his vision will continue. All right. It's gonna be very hard to change his vision. So I don't think when Martin Isle says, um, you know, we need to adapt, right? I'm here to like bring us into the new, the next generation and adapt. I don't think he means like, well, we gotta, we're gonna tweak the, um, you know, the, the core values of this uh, particular organization. No, Ken Ham's brought him in here to be the same core values that Ken Ham has. Um, now he's younger and he is recognizing that society is changing and we need to, um, change sometimes the way that we come to them, right? Our approach, not what we believe, but how we communicate with that. And I think this is going to be even more social media, uh, developing platforms that are going to be like, uh, well, what Answers in Genesis is already doing, right? They already bought this $31 million um, um, center, all right? Basically their center of operations. And in that it's going to be their school, but the other half of it is like a multimedia operation, right? They're going to become a media company, right? They're going to employ, they're going to have news programs and they're going to be more on, you know, th their own TV station and have their own programming and probably like their own, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to come up with like their own news. It's like, uh, like a, a competitor to just say Newsmax or something like that. 
but a completely Christian based <laughs> Christian nationalist uh, news station. Right. Even OAN isn't good enough for them. Right. They want even more control uh, over the content. Uh, and the content will be from this specific viewpoint. So it's a, you know, as the world becomes more secular, it's a safe space, right, for their audience to get all their content, all their news, all their information about the world can be filtered through answers in Genesis. And so I think this is I, I think this is what Ken Ham is envisioning, and you know he's gotten to the point where they're getting really close to being able to have that larger sphere of influence within the Christian community, um, and he thinks to be a seed, right, a muster seed, a, a, you know, a levitating uh, force, you know, within uh, uh, culture to bring them back to God's authority. Uh, but I think Martin Isles is like sees that particular vision too. And probably something like he would never be able to implement in Australia, but he can come to America and be able to do this, right? We're not too far away and we still have the capacity for maybe you know, turning this ship around. Now, part of the email he sent out to all of his uh, followers uh, through Answers in Genesis also talks about the fact that he's setting up uh, ministry in Australia. I mean, the Australian Answers in Genesis ministry has been kind of like pretty much non-existent for quite a while. Remember, they answered in Genesis split quite a while ago. And so his Ken Ham's friends, most of the ones that were from Australia that were associated with answered Genesis in the past, so the answers in Genesis did have a significant presence in Australia. They split off from him right there. That's Creation Ministries International now. And so Ken Ham really hasn't had much of a footprint in Australia. He goes back for like vacation, but he doesn't go back. He's rarely gone back and done a lot of speaking there. But now he's going back for a big speaking tour with Martin Isles, and Martin Isles is setting up and getting people involved in a in a, a much more organized organization in Australia. But I get the sense that Martin Isles is like, you know, he's here, he's working here, but he's going to put into place a ministry in Australia. So that's a, a growth area uh, for Answers in Genesis. Oh, oh yeah, back to this. We haven't gotten very far in this announcement yet. The culture is changing fast. The next generation is different. Ah, see, now we're getting to like, what does he mean by adapt? Well, the next generation is different. The culture is, well, the culture is going, the culture in his mind is going to a hell in a handbasket, right? Uh, and now here's the key. I just talked about this. I got ahead of myself. Digital technology is disrupting our existence. That's partly a statement of like, yes, social media, all these things is, is, uh, is kind of bad for society. But on the other hand, we're going to utilize it for good. I mean, we're, we're not going to deny social media and we're not going to deny the fact that there's, it's a digital world, right? We're going to, we're going to jump on that digital world. We're going to conform it and twist it to make it to our advantage. Okay. Now here, here's some, here's some curious fuzzy words. Um, but these are all just signaling devices to his audience, right? That, that, that's what these are. These are just words that I mean, most of his audience don't really know what they mean, couldn't define them, but they have this sense in terms of how the culture worlds are and how um, fundamentalists talk about these types of things. They just sort of have a sense for like, this is what this person is trying to say, even though they don't know what these words mean. If that makes any sense, right? Just as scientific naturalism has threatened the faith of so many, right? This is a like, can uh, this is a, you know, this is the problem of evolutionary biology, right? It's, it's a, it's a secular theory. Uh, it's a godless thing, and it has affected the faith of so many, right? Scientific naturalism. Postmodernism, all right, so that's the problem from the past, right? That's the thing that's been happening over the last 150 years. God has been removed from our understanding of nature and science and has led us to like a belief in an old earth and evolutionary biology and all those evils, right? And those are the things that Ken Ham was battling, right? Those things that creation science raised up, you know, as, uh, as a, as a science, right. Or supposed science in order to combat this scientific naturalism and to bring God back into science and correct that particular view such that we come back to, um, the true knowledge of the history of the world, which is a young earth and, uh, instantaneous creation of the kinds of organisms. All right, so that's destroyed the faith of so many over the last 150 years. That's why we're where we are 
That's, that's the reason why we're in such bad shape. And then he's going to point to Australia and say, look, look, you just go to Australia. That's where you're eventually going to end up if you continue down this path. But now we have additional problems. And this is, again, why, you know, the adaptation is needed, right? This is why Answers in Genesis can't just be a creation science ministry. Um, but it has been transitioning to something else. And it's going to continue to transition even uh, even more so under uh, Martin Isles. Is that, at least this is my interpretation uh, of this. Because now he says, postmodernism and new critical theories threaten the faith of a new generation. Right? Postmodernism and new critical theories threaten the faith of a new generation. So the next generation, well, they're already challenged by you know scientific naturalism. That's already embedded in culture. But we're going to heap upon that postmodernism and new critical theories. So I'm not sure most of his audience really like knows exactly what he means by that. It's just a it's just a general cover for you know the ills of this world. Why do we have culture breaking down, right? Why is everything going to pot uh, in society uh, within the framework within the mind of Martin Isles and Ken Ham? Uh, it's because of postmodernism and critical theory right postmodernism postmodernism is you know leads to moral relativism right it's epistemological relativism it's it's the fact that we don't have you know real truths that we have uh, alternative facts for everything that anybody can believe whatever they want as long as they believe it you have to you have to um respect their beliefs no one's beliefs are better than anyone other other person's belief right there's no objective reality and in some postmodernism is like, you know, if there's no objective reality, well, where does that put the Bible? Because that is reality. And so that is an anathema to, um, you know, Ken Ham and so forth. And so can't have this postmodern. So this is, this is the threat of the new generation. All right, so this is the threat of the new generation. This is, this is what's attacking us now. But what about this, this reference to critical theory? Now, I'm sure that in that, now see, Martin Isles being from Australia, not being really involved in American culture very much, he really hasn't been here a whole lot. He doesn't understand America, which I think is going to be one of his big challenges. I mean, Ken Ham came a long time ago. He understands American culture. He knows how to talk to his audience that's, that's ensconced in this particular culture. Uh, and I have an example, if I get to it, of Martin Isles' lack of cultural uh, awareness, you know, um, because he, he attacks Halloween. Uh, in a way that, you know, I think Ken Ham would probably kind of agree with him, but I think Ken Ham would know not to say some of the things that Martin Miles has said about, about, um, about Halloween. There's just like topics you don't need to like really go into. I mean, but I understand Martin Isle coming, Martin Isle is coming from Australia where they, they don't really have the same, uh, kind of craziness over Halloween. Uh, it's kind of mystified by this whole like culture of Christians, you know, celebrating Halloween, which seems like, again, like an anathema to him. Um, and so there's kind of a, some culture shock actually for, for Martin Isles. And so he, he, it's going to take him a while to sort of sort out, um, how to talk about cultural issues in the U S so, but what he's doing here is of course, he's caught on to the fact that critical race theory, you know, critical theory, uh, is, is like a big catchword, And that if you just say that you're against critical theory, then that, that somehow, you know, sets you up as a, um, a conservative Bible believing Christian. And that's what all of them should be is opposed to any kind of critical theory. Um, even if I am, I am certain that if I were to have a conversation with Martin Isles, he probably really doesn't understand critical theory, um, and what it is exactly, but it doesn't matter. All he needs to know is that's bad. And that's sort of an outgrowth of postmodernism. And there is, there is a relationship there uh, with postmodern thought. Um, but you know, like, Here's a, you know, like, what about this? Like, I'm sure he would look at that saying like, that must be bad just because it has the name on it, right? Biblical critical theory. I mean, how can you have critical theory of the Bible? What, what's that have to do with that? Uh, how the Bible's unfolding story makes sense in modern life and culture. So this book is about, uh, you know, taking uh, concepts from critical theory uh, applying them to the Bible, understanding how that affects uh, culture. It's actually written, this is a fairly, uh, I would say, you know, conservative Christian has written this book. This is not, this is not a liberal book by any means. And, you know, and I've been working my way through this book because uh, it's, a, it's a come out recently and made some news. And, 
um, I was interested in that particular topic. I'm interested in the application of biblical ideas to culture around us and how we respond to culture and shape culture. Uh, and that's that's totally what this book is about, is, is shaping culture um, from a Christian worldview. Um, but, you know, Bart Niles is going to, you know, think that critical theory, you know, nothing good come from that. It's this very black and white view. Now, I don't read this book and say like, oh, yeah, this is this is the answer, right? This has got it all. Uh, I think there's some really good thoughts in here, really good ideas. Um, and But I would be <laughs> critical, haha, of many of the concepts that are in this book uh, myself. Right. And so, you know, Mark Niles, maybe you should read this book, right? Faces at the Bottom of the Well uh, by Derek Bell, you know, and probably just holding this book up is going to make some of my audience groan, um, especially creationists to be like, yeah, you can't read that. That's, uh, you know, antithetical to the Bible somehow, because this is like one of the founding books of cr uh, uh, critical race theory. Right. But I think it's really important that you read, like, you know, what is it that the people who have um, are foundational to the ideas behind critical race theory? Um, where do their ideas come from and how do they express them? I mean, if you if you want to, like, see what critical race theory is, right, and how how it's thought through, I mean, this would be a good place to start. Uh, it's a really interesting book. Um, and I feel like Having read that and a few others, um, I have a greater appreciation for um, critical theory. Um, I'm by no means any expert, and I would have trouble sitting down and really having a deep conversation about it, despite having read those books. But I at least know when somebody doesn't know what they're talking about, and that's kind of the that's the thing. I you know it's, I think it's really important to to read and understand uh, different perspectives from different sides of things just so you know when somebody doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a big part of it. Um, it's kind of like, you know, knowing a bunch about science and then you know when you read a creation science article when they don't actually have any idea what they're talking about. Okay, uh, sorry, tangent there. Yeah, so that whole clause is just like, uh, it's those are just trigger words thrown out, right? They're uh, tribe identification terms. Hey, look. I'm against this stuff and you've heard of these things and you know, they're all bad. Uh, and so therefore, see, I'm a good guy. I'm with Ken Ham. These are the things we're really fighting, right? This is what we're fighting for you for. Just come to answers in Genesis. We have all the material. We're going to have a new station. We're going to have, uh, videos. We're going to have movies. We're going to have, we're going to have everything that you can wrap your life around. Uh, and that's going to protect you from this new post-Christian society that's coming. Now, of course, we want to reform society and we want to conform it to the Bible. Uh, and, you know, we're happy that we have a Speaker of the House that's, uh, um, you know, going to institute some of the, or going to try to institute some of these, bring us back to being a Christian nation uh, in their minds. And so we can use politics and they're very much involved in politics. Martin Niles is going to be, you know, you know, playing the political games. Um, Ken Ham has sidled up to a lot of uh, politicians and has, even though he doesn't speak it directly to his audience very much, he's very much involved. Um, and so there is sort of this uh, political, you know, side of things. Like if we could transform the government by putting the right people in charge, then we can institute policies, which eventually will cause people to cr become Christianized, right? We will, um, you know, force Christianity down that way. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's not the way they would think of it. Um, it's a top-down approach to changing culture. Um, but we're also working on a ground-up approach, right? And the ground-up approach is like, you know, convert the masses uh, and then have them you know, like want leaders that are Christians. By the way, that would be my preferred approach. And I think that that's the way um, that transformation should occur. Oh, yeah. So Martin Niles is, is like, it, it, Andrew Genesis is going to play in several worlds, right? We're, we're trying to influencing leaders, right? We bring in leaders from the church and we, we wouldn't even have politicians and we want to convert top down. Uh, but, you know, mostly we were also, you know, bottom up, but we're also providing protective layer at all the same time. Like if things really do go bad, 
because in a way their eschatology is the world is running down, right? And so they don't really have that hopeful of a vision. Uh, they're not like some Christian nationalists uh, who are post-millennials, right? In terms of their eschatology. So that would be the group from Moscow I've talked about before. They have a positive view of the future in the sense that eventually the world will be Christianized, right? And they absolutely believe that. It's not like uh, we would like to do this. No, it will happen. And so therefore, they have a positive view in terms of shaping society because they believe it really will happen. Whereas Ken Ham has a more, and I believe Martin Isles probably has a more fatalistic uh, viewpoint that the world isn't you know, good for much longer anyway. We're just hunkering down and waiting for uh, Christ to return and take us out of this hellhole. Right. And so things are getting worse. Right. Australia slid down. U.S. is where we're trying to hold it back. Right. We're doing what we can to like prevent us from sliding down the slippery slope to uh, utter secularism and uh, the abandonment of all Christian principles. But um, but it's probably going to happen. So when that happens, you need a safe place right for you and your family. And that's what Answers in Genesis is really providing by providing an entire alternative existence that you can live in. Right. You can separate yourself from the secular society by enveloping yourself in all the answers in Genesis materials, which are going to give you this, uh, you know, this protective bubble that you can survive in. All right. So it's a grand vision, right? It's, it's working on different levels. And these are the types of decisions that an organization like this needs to make. You know, they, they have a lot of resources, but it's still limited. And like, where do you put your time? Like, and that, that comes down to your real beliefs. And that's why I think that's why eschatology matters, right? I've, I've said that before in the station. I haven't talked about it that much, but your eschatology, like trying to understand what a Christian's eschatolo eschatological views are, their views of the end time, their views of what's happening, what, what they would predict should happen uh, to society, uh, explains so much about their views on society uh, and their views on things like climate change and all those other, they're all wrapped up in an eschatological uh, viewpoint. So sometimes I think it's just as important to ask a Christian. And I, I've done this, uh, you know, in conversation, I will typically ask somebody when we're talking about uh, interpretations of Genesis, I'll ask about their interpretations of Revelation. All right, what's your interpretation of the, the end times? Because your interpretation of end times and your hermeneutic, your, your method of interpreting end times typically has something to do with your interpretation of beginning times, right? The beginning. But that's a tangent, a longer tangent for another day. But God's word is a word for every generation. The gospel is God's answer for every generation. We will adapt to that which is new. Um, again, I guess the new is postmodernism, uh, critical theory, um, not so much scientific naturalism because he's going to say that's been around for a long time. We've already, uh, you know, society's already adapted to it and we already have the answers to that. I think he really thinks we don't need to make any progress in Christian in, in uh, creation science. I mean, do we really need to do much more work to prove the world is young and so forth? We, we have those answers. After all, I, I've got the answers book in volume one, volume two, volume three, volume four, and probably working on volume five, right? We've got the answers book. We, you know, our people have already answered all the tough questions. There's not a whole lot more to be done there, right? I don't think there's going to be emphasis. But answers in Genesis really never has had a big emphasis on the on the science side in terms of actually generating, uh, you know, new answers through actual research, right? We've got our token scientists for you know, which which are we trot out and talk about how wonderful they are, like Nathaniel Jensen, and yeah, he's got this great book and all. Right, we've got it right back here. Sitting close by, of course, you know, like traced. There's your answer, right? Read this and you'll have the answer to the history of people on earth and people groups uh, and, and how to explain all the genetic diversity among people uh, coming through the family of, of Noah, right? And, you know, you know we, we, we paid this guy, you know, a year's salary in order to generate this book. Uh, and so there's your answer, right? Just go read this or the simple version. Um, and and you're good. Well, there's there's not a lot more that we need to do in that area, which is why it's like all about the culture wars, right? That's where it's at. So we'll adapt to that which is new, holding fast to that which is timeless. We must move on. All right. So Ken Ham, here's their Facebook page uh, profiles, by the way. Um, and I'm, I'm sure Martin Niles will probably change his soon as he becomes more involved in Answers in Genesis. 
Uh, I just brought this up because I want to show you that Ken Ham has 355,000 followers on Facebook. I think he has more on, on uh, Twitter's kind of similar numbers. And Martin Isles has 226,000 followers. And that, it really comes from before being at Answers in Genesis. So I'm just saying that, yes, he's a known, a known public figure, right? And a very big public figure in Australia. So Ken Ham has found somebody that already has a, a large public footprint. And that's really important. Um, and he has a dynamic footprint. I mean, he is a dynamic speaker. Um, and I think he's a very effective speaker. I was like, Ken Ham is a very effective speaker. Um, a lot of his, you know, but Ken Ham doesn't have the personality. He has developed a personality, but only through um, scripted jokes and so forth, right? He, he's learned timing. It's kind of like, uh, he's not a natural comedian. He's somebody who has been trained how to communicate and he's effective at doing that. I think Martin Isles has natural ability, right? As a natural personality thing that allows him to be able to do what he does uh, in terms of speaking and attracting an audience. By the way, he is, Martin Isles is greatly loved by those who love him and greatly hated by those who don't like him, which include lots of Christians. Um, he will make many enemies as, as he makes many friends. And he will, just like Ken Ham, say, well, that's what happens when you're speaking the truth, right? People either can't handle the truth or they embrace the truth. <laughs> and so that kind of criticism just falls away from them. In fact, they see criticism, the criticisms of them as confirmation that they're doing the right thing rather than, you know, maybe calls for reformation of themselves. Uh, this, I mean, that's just typical of all like charismatic leaders, right? They all fall into that trap of pride in themselves and the truth that they're speaking. Uh, here's how Martin Isles is described on the Answers in Genesis webpage right now. And this is, again, like I, I just checked and it's almost 48 hours after this announcement. Um, and so Answers in Genesis hasn't updated their site to reflect this new position of Martin Isles. So uh, he was originally brought on board as chief ministry officer uh, of Answers in Genesis. So what is he? He is an Australian lawyer, a commentator, a preacher. Um, he's a preacher in the sense of like a Baptist preacher here in the U.S. It doesn't mean he has seminary training. Uh, it just means he's grown up in the church. He's a charismatic talker. And so eventually has talked his way into being a preacher. Um, now I need to do a little more digging on that to see like what his, you know, how much he preaches and how, uh, how often, but he's, he's much like Ken Ham, right? Ken Ham, um, writes and talks as if he's, a you know, like a theologian or something like that, but he's a lay theologian, right? He doesn't have any formal training, uh, in any of these things. And in my mind become, that's very evident, but you know, for, for many people, you know, they, they trust his, his word on things. And he's not a scientist, right? He's not a trained scientist either. And Martin Isles is the same way. I mean, he's definitely not a scientist, he's even less so a scientist. I mean, Ken Ham actually like was a high school teacher and did some science, right? So, I mean, he has a bachelor's degree. Um, Martin Isles, no. I mean, he, he's a lawyer. And um, he, so he's neither trained theologian or trained preacher, at, nor is he a scientist. I mean, he is a leader of an organization in this case. All right, so what was Martin Isles' last job? Uh, he was managing director of the Australian Christian Lobby. Uh, you can think of it as like the, um, uh, like the Homeschool Defense League or something like that, defense, of, uh, I think I got that wrong. Um, uh, you know, a group that is defending Christians and Christian liberty in a society. And you can imagine that's, you know, maybe even more challenging in Australia uh, than it would be here in the U.S. And so what does Martin Isles say about himself? So this is part of the introduction. Uh, I'm going back to the introduction that Ken Ham had back in August. He said, like, yeah, let me introduce Martin Isles. Let me s let him say something about himself to you. And so here's what he's saying. He's saying, when I was in primary school, I came across a big box set of VH tapes. All right. So, I mean, he's obviously living in a uh, exclusive small subset of society in Australia where um, his um, school library has a tape collection of Ken Ham, right? It was a series of talks by a man named Ken Ham. Between Garfield, Inspector Gadget, and Flintstones, for some reason, I decided to pull the first tape in the VH player. Right, that first tape is Creation, Facts, and Bias by Ken Ham. 
Um, and this is from 1986. All right, so this wouldn't be when he watched that. He watched that sometime after that because he's, you know, not quite that old. And then he talks about, I've been watching it. And then he says, the stuff I learned from those types, I still remember and rely on today. I, here's the thing I find interesting about Ken House. I'm sure he's read some answers in Genesis material, but I would say like, I'm sure that I know answers in Genesis material far better than uh, Martin Isles does. Like I could answer uh, the vast majority of questions about what answers in Genesis believes on a particular topic far better than Martin Isles does. He's going to have the general big picture and he will have his talks. I'm sure he'll give talks that include some stuff about scientific evidence for various things like Ken Ham does. But all those talks are already written, right? And he'll put his own little flair on them. Um, but he doesn't have to build anything from the ground up in terms of like figuring things out, right? Okay. They've already figured everything out. I just have to repeat those things. He has no like foundational, like um, he's never tested their material in the sense of reading other, like other Christians who have written about what's wrong with their materials. He's never really read the alternative side very much. He is simply engulfed, you know, he's simply imbibed answers in Genesis material from early on. Um, and it's never been a huge interest of his that I could see. And I've, I've searched all over the place and he doesn't seem to really talk about this topic very much other than it's just like, you know, you know the, the Bible is true, it's authoritative and we believe that the world is young. It's not like he's had like this expressed interest in understanding these questions. So, you know, he hasn't just like sucked this up. I know so many um, young people that just like absorb Young Earth Creationist material and read everything. And some of those who work there are those, those kids, right? Who have grown up and they've just read everything. They know everything that has ever been said by Answers in Genesis and other Young Earth Creationist organizations. That's not Martin Isles. That's not why he's been brought in. He's not, he's not here to, to lead creation science and to be an authority on creation science at all. And so he's just, he's a believer right? <laughs> in their materials. For example, I would do seven days of talks at an Australian youth worldview program called Genesis Blueprints. They were not about dinosaurs, science, or the age of the earth. Well, there it is, right? He's saying like, I talked about Genesis Blueprints, and this is why Ken Ham loves this guy, all right? This is why Ken Ham has found his doppelganger, all right? He kind of looks like him, but certainly in sound and in words, he's, he's a clone. Right, as close of a clone as Ken Ham could find, he has found it in Martin Isles. Right, because yeah, sure, there's dinosaurs and the age of the earth. There are questions that come that people have about Genesis, but I immediately take them beyond Genesis, right? And I take them to questions about sexuality, gender, race, sin, God, masculinity, femininity, climate, empire, life, family, identity, and the gospel. That's Ken Ham. Right, that's what Ken Ham's ministry is taking him to Genesis, answering a couple questions that people might have about what they think are scientific questions, but then this is the this is what I'm really here for. And that's what Martin Isles is here for. But see, I taught all that from Genesis because I know Genesis is reliable. I know what really happened. I know the truth. Right. And then this, this is the presuppositional uh, you know, aspect of this, right? I know the truth and therefore, you know, all you scientists have to do, anyone I employ as a scientist, anything, anybody that's working here at Answers and Genesis, they already know the truth. So all they have to do is just like uh, help people see whatever the new news of the day is. I'm sure Answers and Genesis will continue to like, oh, a new story came out about some dinosaur. Okay, well, now how should you understand that already knowing the truth? Right? That's what Answers News is that's on twice a week. It's just, all right, we already know the answer. Now let's tell you like how you can fit what are you just heard out there in the secular world into this particular answer. All right, I know it's God's blueprint answers the lies of today. I know this because of Ken. All right. Ken, wait, right? Ken is my guide. I was equipped to stand in post-Christian Australia by the efforts and resources of many people, all made available through multimedia, the internet, and digital technologies. See his emphasis? All right. You might think he thinks that digital technologies are bad based on something he said earlier, but really it's like 
It's transforming the world. And we're going to use that, that source because it helped transform me. Because how did I ever get to learn Young Earth Creationism? It's not because Can Ham was here, really. All right? It's because I had his tapes. Right? And, and I was surrounded by a world of secular science. That bookshelf had lots of other books on it about Darwin, but I had Ken Ham, and that led me to the truth. So I'm running long, so let's just leave it at this. Um, interest in Genesis is entering into an interesting phase of their future. And I, I do believe, after having read enough here and thought through this over the last couple of months, I think Cunningham has found the ideal person to replace himself with. I'm, I'm amazed that he's been able to scrape up something that, that actually has a chance of working. Um, it also has a chance of becoming a disaster. Uh, and I'm sure that there's concern and answers in Genesis for this. I mean, any organization that makes a change at the top is always, gonna, is always going to uh, have a shaking out period. And so the next six months to a year is going to be an interesting, I think, shaking out period. Uh, Martin Isles, I don't think really anybody had interest in Genesis other than maybe Andrew Snelling probably knows him at all personally. Uh, and so he's, a, he's an unknown to the employees there. All right, people have worked there for long periods of time. And they're there because they're dedicated to Ken Ham. I mean, they're dedicated to the message, but they believe in Ken Ham's vision. Uh, and this guy has a what looks to be the same vision, but he won't necessarily have the same personality, the same way of interacting with them on a day-to-day -day level. It's one thing to have the, the same vision, but you still have to be comfortable with the person who's leading that vision. Uh, and Mark Niles, is, there's no doubt in my mind, is going to come in and he's going to be a taskmaster in the sense of he has a vision. Now, it might be Ken Ham's vision, but he's going to lay it out and he's going to stick to it and he's going to... Um, uh, rule the roost, right? Um, he's very aggressive, right? All reports are that he is very aggressive in what he thinks is right, he will do. Um, and very aggressive to his critics. And this is going to be a situation where, uh, just like Ken Ham, there really isn't any, like, having any shadow of doubt about things and working for this guy. Uh, and so there may be those, I predict there'll be a couple people at Answers in Genesis will probably be, uh, be uncomfortable um, with this new style of leadership, um, which again, I think it's going to be similar style, but because it's from somebody who's unfamiliar, the same style could rub you the wrong way. I mean, lots of people are rubbed the wrong way by Ken Ham. There's people outside of the younger, there are young earth creationists, a lot of them out there who don't have any fond memories or, uh, uh, uh particularly care for Ken Ham's style. Right. And so therefore they, they could never work there. Uh, and Martin Owls is going to be that same way. He's going to attract a certain small subset of young earth creationists who will be able to tolerate his, uh, his unique style. Um, and anyone else who can't is going to be gone. So I expect some, some turnover in answers in Genesis. I think he'll be very successful at pushing the, the multimedia angle. And um, I think he'll be a good fundraiser. He's going to sound wonderful on the surface. I think he'll be... Um, I think I think the general audience of young earth creationists is going to be really, is going to gravitate to him because I think his personality is a better fit for a CEO in terms of his outward appearance, his external appearance when he speaks. Um, but I th I very much get the feeling like he's one of these people that can put on a good face, but is a very different person, you know, one on one and within within the community itself, right within the the organization. It's kind of like a lot of politicians, right? Good, good politician knows like how to project a particular message, but then you often hear that they're like a completely different person uh, when you're working for them. Uh, yeah, I'm very intrigued. Obviously, I'm intrigued of what will happen. Um, I think the doomsayers who felt like Andrews and Genesis is just going to fall apart. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't predict that. Um, I think there is some chance that this could create major factions and or f could fracture Answers in Genesis in some ways. Um, and it's an opportunity for other organizations maybe to gain some kind of foothold in this uh, post, this short sort of post-ham period. Um, well, it's not really a post-ham period yet because ham's going to be around, right? 
I, I, nobody knows for how long, but I think he'll still be uh, active. As long as he physically is able to be active, he's going to be active, right? There's, there's no retirement in a, in a person like him. Um, he's not going to retire. He's still going to be active uh, and influential as long as he is as physically and mentally capable of being so. So interesting times ahead. And I'm sure that on This Week in Creationism, we'll have many opportunities to talk about like things that are happening at Answers in Genesis. And we're going to watch the trajectory of Answers in Genesis going forward. And it's going to be, like I said, a fascinating way to look at like how this proceeds. Um, and I'm just like right from the get go, I find just a little one little thing kind of just in a, a little bit surprising detail. And that is that Answers in Genesis itself, Ken Ham himself was not the spokesperson or the front person in order to announce this decision by the Answers in Genesis board. Uh, he hasn't said anything about it yet on his social media. It hasn't. Uh, there's been nothing on the Answers in Genesis website about this. Uh, there's been an email that has gone out to some followers, but it's not a public facing uh, thing that I can see. And I find that intriguing uh, because that's maybe that is really Ken Ham pulling back and saying like, you deserve, you deserve to be the person to announce this uh, because you're the person who's now in charge. Or did Martin Isle simply jump the gun? He was excited about being uh, the new CEO of Answers in Genesis and wants to tell everybody because he's just announcing this on Facebook, right, to his followers. Um, so this isn't a, a as a formal announcement in the sense of like it's on official letterhead. Well, actually, the email, I guess, is from Answers in Genesis that went out to 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 uh, people that are on the email list. Um, yeah, so I don't know, just a kind of a. I, you know, kind of a not the transition message or like moment I met, but maybe it's kind of like a, you know, uh, you hire a new manager, like the Guardians, they hire a new manager. The word gets out like who they've hired, but then like a week later, they have the actual press conference and they have like, hey, big news, we've hired this particular person. Well, everybody already knew, but it didn't become official, right? <laughs> Until that particular time. Uh, so maybe that's what we've got coming up in the next week. I actually waited like 24 hours to make this video because I thought, well, maybe I better see what something, you know, what else comes out of this, what the response to this is, or whether Ken Ham has something to say before I say something. But hey, there's nothing there yet. So I said, I got to talk about this um, because it's big news. It really is. This is this is a big deal. This is a, I, I can't emphasize enough. This is a face which you have on the screen, not my face. This face over here, eh, over here, right? That's a face you're going to see a lot. All right. I think it's going to be, he's, he's become, he's going to be a public figure um, that's going to be recognized, well, certainly throughout the entire world of young earth creationism, but beyond. I mean, Ken Ham is a known entity well beyond young earth creationism. Uh, and I think Martin Isles has his eye on becoming more famous than Ken Ham. I mean, you know, he, he intends on being a significant figure in the culture of the United States uh, within the next few years. And so that's something that bears watching. All right, that's it. Um, hey, thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, well, I've got a bunch of stuff for a real episode of This Week in Creationism. Uh, coming up and of course a little bit about Ken Ham in there but uh, mostly we're going to talk about uh, has Noah's Ark been found uh, can, yeah, answers in Genesis response to that news and what else do I have in there mm, I can't remember several other items I've got listed already that I'm working up I'll do that in the next couple of days all right hey thanks for hanging out with me um, my name is Joel Duff and um, it's been good talking to you We'll see you later. Bye-bye.